and then more and more about that. So now this this uh, this today's uh, message may seem kind of funny because of the way today worked out with you know like most of the church going to watch Brock race motorcycles and all that stuff. But Vertical Church has a goal to reach 800 people in the city of Lapine. And I know, and I, and I know some people think, well, how do you get 800 numbers and what does that mean and, and how does that all break down? So I'm going to tell you. So 800 people is the goal of an average weekly attendance at church, right? That's just the average. So there may be weeks where there's, you know, a thousand people, 700 people, but the average regular attendance of 800 people right here in the city of Lapine. And I already know what's going on in people's heads. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's a little much for the city of Lapine. Lapine has between 20, depending on what time of year it is, between uh, about 19 to 39,000 people who do not attend church. Right? Just think about 20, about 20 to, to 40,000 people, depending on what time of the year, who do not attend church right here in the city of Lapine. So if everybody in the city of Lapine decided to go to church one day, there would not be enough churches to accommodate everybody. Because only about um, there's only about 2,000 people in this city that attend church. Wow. So... And it, and it really and it breaks down to what's because during the summer we get the influx of all the people coming from California and Arizona, right? So they're people too, right? We need to reach them just as much as we reach the, the full time uh, hardy folk, right? Yeah. So, and 800 people, I know that sounds like a lot, but when there's between 22,000 and 42,000 people that live here, 800 people is 6.25% of the population. Yeah, we do. That's not even 10% of the population. 6.25% of the city of Lupine on average at our church. And, and, and that's, that's all great. And this is a, this is a future uh, goal and, and a focus. And I know, and, and it, it, it seems like it's so far out of reach right now. But God is an awesome God. And God wants more and more people to hear his message. God wants more and more people to come to church. Amen? Amen. And, and we can... We can focus on that stuff, but we need to focus on the why we do what we do. Because if we don't focus on the why, the what, and the when doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Right? We can focus on the end goal, but if we don't understand why we're doing this, none of that stuff really matters in the end place, in the, in, in the, in the end. So I have a question. Have you ever found yourself in a hopeless situation? Yes. Right? This should be a 100% response on that, right? The answer is yes. yes right? we, we've all found ourselves in a hopeless situation. And I know everybody sitting in here has done it because I'm probably the youngest, well, maybe Amber, is, you know, we're the youngest people here. We've been in hopeless situations. And for most of you, you've been around a little longer. I know you've been in a hopeless situation, right? If I've already done it, you've already been there. And uh, so I have some pictures to help illustrate some hopeless situations. So the first one, Mary. So, if you cannot see, this is a little chipmunk squirrel thing. And he is stuffing his face. He's got this whole pile of peanuts sitting there. It looks like he's got at least two in his mouth already. He's getting ready to stuff another one in there. All right? How many of you feel like that on Monday morning? Right? You can name your situation peanuts or just Monday morning or whatever it is, right? You find yourself trying to stuff more and more in there, right? It's a hopeless situation. This next one is really, I like this one. <laughs> How many of you have ever felt like the donkey? Or just the load you're carrying seems a little bit too much, right? <clears throat> next week, the next week's whole entire service is basically based off this picture. Right? <laughs> and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> so that poor he ain't even touching the ground. Next picture. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> Hopeless situation. You've ever wondered where KFC got their chicken? Right? <laughs> this is it right here. <laughs> That's a hopeless situation. <laughs> and uh, 
So I, so I have this statement that if you're not saved, it, you're like, I don't really know if I believe that, but it's true. And if you are saved, you'll understand. And basically, this is what this entire series comes down to. The grace of God gives a, given to us through Jesus Christ changes lives. The grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ changes lives. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Good stuff. That, this is... This is why we do church, because the grace of God given to us, because God is doing a mighty work in us, it should change our lives through the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there's, there's five, five true things about people who don't know Jesus. And, and before Mary goes there, we're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. So you go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And how, how many of you are type A people? You know what a type A person is? Like, you need things in order, right? So, if you're pointing at the person next to you. So, if you are a type A person, we're gonna, then you're going to love this. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 the whole time. Right? But we're not going to go verse by verse. We're going to kind of skip around, and I know that's going to make you feel a little uh, bothered and uncomfortable. So, just go ahead and get bothered and uncomfortable. Awesome. You, you over it now? Right. Yeah. So, no, so in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the church. And you have to understand this. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, full of church people. Right? Mm -hmm. The church is full of church people. And Paul is writing Ephesians to the church. So we're going to start with verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. Notice Paul did not say, as for you, you had issues. As for you, you were a bad person. He said, as for you, you were dead. Now I know, if, if, you, if for those who don't know Christ, you're not a bad person. You're a dead person. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, there is no life in you, and you are dead. Right? So this is, you guys remember we used the illustration of Barry Allen a few weeks ago? Nobody? The Flash. So the Flash, right? Remember we used, we, how many of you have been to a funeral before? Mm -hmm. Right? Most people, right? How many of you have been to like an open casket funeral? Right, that's even a little weirder than just a normal because they got the casket open and, and you walk. Let's pretend our buddy Billy, uh, Barry Allen, he is dead in the box in front of the church and we're all walking up there to take a look at our buddy Barry. And I'm standing there and I'm like, and I looked at you and I said, hey, I think Barry might pull through this thing. <laughs> You'd be like, what? He's dead, right? Like, oh, no, 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 he might, I think if we, if we dress him up right, give him different clothes and, and, and put a little cross around his neck and, 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 and you know, maybe put him in a different box, I mean, I think we can, I mean, he might pull through this thing. You would look at me like, there, there are some drugs that are in your life. Right? Because there is no, nothing alive is going to come out of Barry's life anymore because he is dead. dead. Right? He's dead. So what is the first thing that we learn about people who don't know Christ? We're going to write it down. Now, I don't know how to spell dead. anything like above three letters. You know, four is pushing it for me. So I'm not a very good speller. That's why I said But I can, I can spell dead. But the ones we start getting to after this, you're going to have to help me out, and it's going to be awesome, right? Because technology, as much as I love technology, it's made us dumber, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because it can spell check everything. It'll give me a little line to say, oh, not only did you misspell this word, but this sentence is a fragment, and it doesn't even make sense. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't know how to fix that, so we're just going to leave the green line, but the red line I can fix. And I don't even have to do nothing. I just click the button, and it fixes it for me, right? And that's awesome. So I know how to spell dead, right? D-E-D. Dead. D-E-D. Nobody got that. So if you don't know Jesus, you are dead. 
There is no life in you. You are spiritually dead. So the next, the next, the next one. We're going to be in verse 12 for a while. So, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ. You were separated from Christ. Now, I don't know how to spell separate. Yes. S E P A R A R A T E. A T E. Separate. You're separate from Christ. Has anybody ever had separation anxiety? Oh, yeah. Right? This is. How, all right, let me. How many husbands get anxious when their wives take the credit card to the mall? <laughs> How many felt a little anxious just right then? She hadn't even done it yet, right? How many, this is like, I lose my wallet and my keys probably the most out of everything that I own. I do. I mean, I put it down and I'll put it like right where I'm going to find it next to the computer. And I will walk, especially when I'm going to work, and I can't find my keys, and I can't find my wallet, and then I'm up and down every room, you know, throwing stuff around, and flipping over beds, and trying to find, Kizzy knows what I'm talking about, right? Those are the two most, and it's separation anxiety, because when I lose those things, I don't like to lose those things, because I need the keys to get to work, and I, have, I don't need my wallet, because I got my license memorized, but I need my wallet, because it just makes the police mad when you don't have a driver's license. Even though they can look you up right there in the spot. But, you know, does anybody, anybody get anxious when they, how many of you have ever lost your phone? All right, and it makes you a little agitated, right? A little, a little separation anxiety. How many of you have forgotten your kid one time? <laughs> You're like, oh, wait a minute. Right? A little separation anxiety, right? I have been around long enough to know that every single person walking the face of the planet has some sort of spiritual anxiety because we find ourselves, especially if you don't know Christ, you know why they're, they're so, there's no hope for them? Because they're separate from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And because they're separate from Christ, they are dead. Mm -hmm. right, you see where Paul's going with this stuff? Right? Paul's awesome. Separation anxiety affects everybody. Spiritually, if you are separate from Christ, you have no hope because not only are you separate from Christ, that's why you go around and you have these relationships that don't fulfill you anymore. And, and you think, well, you know, we'll just have the kids and that'll help our marriage. And what happens when the kids leave? The marriage falls apart because you're, you're, you're anchored into something that does not sustain. Relationships cannot sustain you. Only Jesus Christ can anchor your soul for eternity. And that's why when you when the, the affair that you had didn't work either, because you're trying to fill a void that only God can fill. Separate and dead. Mm -hmm. Amen. So what else does Paul say? Uh, you, were, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. So what does Paul say? He says, not only are you dead, you're separate, but you're also a foreigner. And you're going to have to help me out with that one too. F O R O R E I E I G N. You sure? N E R. G N E R. You're a foreigner. I'm feeling accomplished now. You know how I can tell who the Pentecostal people are and who the Presbyterians are? The Pentecostals are calling out letters. The Presbyterians are like, we ain't supposed to talk in church, right? That's, that's how you tell the difference. So, you know, how many of you have ever been to a country outside of the United States where English is not the primary language? Right? Now, now Canada doesn't count, right? Because, you know, we actually own Canada. We just haven't taken them over yet. And, uh, you know, they... So, but how many of you have been to a, a country... So let's say... Let's say we go to... What's a country? We'll, we'll go to we'll go to Germany, right? What what was another one? Mexico. Mexico don't count. We own them too. Italy. <laughs> Italy, right? So we'll go we we'll go to Italy, right? And they don't speak English there as a primary. They speak Italian, right? And this is what happens when we go to foreign countries, especially as Americans. I know because I'm American and I've been to foreign countries, right? So we go to a place like Italy. 
we show up there and they speak Italian and we don't speak Italian and then we go up to someone who's who's from Italy and we and we say something like hey where is the leaning tower of Pisa and they look at us and they go right because they don't speak English and then for some reason in the American mindset we think if we just yell it at them there will be some sort of magic button that clicks in their mind and they'll just be able to understand what we're saying and say where is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And then they curse us out in Italian and walk away and, and we don't know what's going on. Right? Why is that? Because they don't speak our language. We're, we're foreigners, right? They're foreigners. People who don't know Christ, this is why I think the church in America has been so marginalized because people who don't know Christ are foreigners and we sit there and we yell at them thinking if we just yell at them they'll understand but they don't speak our language and we have to, we should be a church that comes together and says, hey, we, we, don't, we don't speak your language, but why don't you come into this embassy because we are ambassadors of Christ here on this earth, and this would be the embassy. We should pull them in and say, hey, we'll figure out how to speak your language so we can show you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right? If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're a foreigner, mm -hmm. separate from God, who is spiritually dead. Paul is awesome. See, I don't have to come up with this stuff. Paul already did it all. Right? So, not only are you foreigners to the covenant of the promise, you are without hope. I got that one. Right? Thank you. H-O-P-E. You are without hope. Have you ever been in a situation to where you just, like hope just finally arrives? And it, and it just feels like you can just now take a breath, mm -hmm. right? So this is this is this is what this is like. As a soldier, you're on the battlefield, and, and you you've been cut off from your your unit, and you're sitting there, and you're fighting back against the enemy, and you know how many bullets you have because you counted them before you left, and you're you're you're, you're shooting bullets down the range. You don't hear anybody coming. You're starting to feel alone and without hope because your ammo is running out, and you don't know what's going to happen because when 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 the ammo's gone. It's gone. There's nothing left, right? And, and you just feel this fear that begins to come over you, and, and you start to wonder, how am I going to get through this? What's going to happen next? And then all of a sudden, the squad makes their way around the building with, like, all the ammo and bigger guns, and, and they shoot bullets a lot faster than the one that you got, and, and, and you just have this, this relief that comes over. It's like, oh, there's hope. Right? I can now get through this situation. right? And I use the military because... Uh, we're soldiers for Christ. Praise God. But without Jesus Christ, you have no hope. You're a foreigner, separate from God, spiritually dead. So if there, there's one more, right? Five things about truths about people who don't know Jesus. And without God. And spell that one too. Amen. Right? You are without God. Because without God, you can have no hope. Without God, you are a foreigner. foreigner. Without God, you are separate. separate. Without God, you are dead. dead. So without God, there is, there is no hope for you. Without God, there is no peace in your life. Without God, there is no joy that you can have. There's these temporary things that the world tries to put on as a fake mask that says, you can have joy and peace without God. Look, look at all these people are doing it. It's a false hope and a false peace and a false joy because without God, there is no joy inside of you. Without God, there is no peace that lives inside of you. Without God, you can have no hope because you're a foreigner, separate, and dead. Five truths about people who don't know who, who God is, right? But there's a dichotomy that comes. See, that's a fancy word. But dichotomy. Spell it. I got it written down. <laughs> Let me find it in my notes. D i c h o t o m y. Dichotomy. Right. All right. But without God, because see, without God, the Bible says that Jesus Jesus said, "I am the true vine; you are the branches. If you remain in me, you have uh, hope. But without, apart from me." You can do nothing. Without God, you can do 
nothing. It is impossible to do anything without God. And I know some people, well, you know, well, wait, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. You can do nothing separated from God. That's why there's a gap between the boards. The dichotomy is going to come on that board and say, and there's a bridge here that you cannot make on your own. Sorry. Only God can take you from this board mm -hmm. to this board. Only Jesus can bridge that gap. And without God, you have no hope of bridging the gap. Without God, you are a foreigner. You cannot make the journey. Without God, you are separate from Him. Without God, you are yeah. dead. Amen. Amen. That's such good stuff. So if there's five truths about, thing, about people who don't know Jesus, the dichotomy comes where there are five truths that Paul gives us of those who do know Jesus. In Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 4, it says, But because of His great love for us, aren't you glad that God has great love for us? I mean, Amen. not just love, but God has great love for us. God... Who is what? Rich in, rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. A God who is rich in mercy. Not poor, not stingy, but rich in mercy. Verse 5. Made us alive with Christ. God who is rich in mercy made us what? Alive. Alive. A-L-I-V-E. Not dead, but alive. alive. Not dead, but alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. saved. Who, what, how do we get saved? Grace. By the grace of God. And what did He do for us? He made us Alive. He didn't make bad people good people. He didn't come to make bad people good people. He came to make dead people alive. Amen. Dead people alive. Not good to bad or bad to good, but dead to alive. Without Christ, you are spiritually dead. With Christ, you are alive. And because we are alive, we should celebrate that fact because it's by the grace of God that we have been saved. And that, uh, this is good stuff. By the grace of God, we've been saved. Amen. Not by our works, not by our tickets, not because we could bridge the gap between death and life. Without Jesus, there is no life. Right. You're just dead. Like Barry Allen in the coffin. Right? But with Jesus, He has made us alive, right? Jesus did not die on the cross to make bad people good. Jesus did not die to make you religious. Because religious just means return to bondage. Mm -hmm. Jesus died on the cross so that you could have life and have life everlasting. Jesus died on the cross so you could have a relationship with God the Father. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He died to bring you to life and to set you free. And if you're not walking in the freedom of the grace of God, this is this is, this is why one of the chapters in the book that I'm going to write, it has to do with this very issue. There are so many people in church who walk around pretending to be alive, but really they're dead. And what is, a, what is something that pretends to be alive but is really dead? Zombies. <laughs> right? This is what happens in the church. People walking around pretending to be alive, but they're really dead. We have to understand, church, that in the grace of God, we have so much freedom. Because of the grace of God that has set us free. free. Oh, it's not in the scripture. But the, the, it's in the Bible. Right? Mm -hmm. The grace of God has set us free to be alive. Yeah. Not sitting in church dead, pretending to be alive. Verse uh, 14. For He Himself is our what? Peace. 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 He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and His uh, destroyed, and the barrier, the dividing wall, 
of hostility. So he has come, and what has he done with us? He's brought us together. T O G E A no, T H. T H. To get her. E R. I told you, I can't spell. God uses the foolish things of the world. That's me. He's brought us together. This is what, this is, when you're alive in Christ and you're together with Christ, this is how you can go through the storms in life. Because there's, there's one thing. You are either going into a storm, you are in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm, getting ready to go into another storm, right? That's, that's the way it is. But together with Christ, a separate from Christ, there's nothing that can anchor your soul to eternity. Together with Christ, He is the anchor that anchors our soul so we can get through the storms. This is when you go on like uh, sailing trips around the world, those guys that do the sailboats and stuff. You, you know what storms happen when they do those things, right? And sometimes they're going to park their boats in like some sort of cove and all that. What's the one thing on the boat that you almost never think about is well, what kind of anchor do I have, right? Because it's just part of the boat. I guarantee you, if you go through a bad storm, after that storm, if that anchor that you had held, you're going to know the brand of that anchor. You're going to know how much it costs. You're going to know where it came from. Why? Because that anchor saved your life. That anchor kept you grounded as the storm came through. And that's what Christ does for us. We are together, alive in Christ, so He can anchor us through the storms. Yep. Amen. Amen. Uh, next, uh, next verse, 19. Consequence, consequently, you are no longer what? Foreigners. You are no longer foreigners, but what? Fellow citizens. Fellow citizens with God, with God's people, and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets with the Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. With Christ, we are alive, we're together, and we're also citizens. And that's C-I-T-I-T-I-Z-E-N-S. Citizens. No longer foreigners, but citizens. Isn't God's word awesome? I mean, Paul's really got it locked down, right? We are now citizens with Christ. And what happens when you become a citizen? You get all the rights and privileges of that nation. Don't you? When you become an American citizen, you get all the rights and privileges of being an American, right? The right to vote, the right to, to free, freedom of religion, all those, all those things that the rest of the world holds back. You have those rights as an American citizen. What kind of rights do you have as a citizen of Jesus Christ and a citizen of heaven? There's 66 books right here that describe all the rights and privileges you have. You have freedom from sin. You no longer have to be held bondage to those things. You have life that will never be taken from you because you are a citizen of Jesus Christ. You have the ability to overcome addictions and, and, and uh, mental uh, anguish and all those things because you're a citizen of Christ. Because you're a citizen, you can have hope. You can have joy. You can have healing. You can have those things right now Amen. as a citizen of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, Ephesians... 2.17. Amen. I got it right. He came and preached peace. He gained who? Jesus. Jesus. To you who were far away and peace to those who were near. near. What did he preach? Peace. peace. And what do you have? Peace. So if you have peace, that means you are filled Got filled with hope. That's an H, not an N. We are filled with hope because we are citizens of heaven and we're together with Christ, and because of Christ, we are now alive, right? This is all in the same set of, set of scripture. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. We now have hope in our lives. We, that, that, it's amazing to have hope. Uh, verse 20, uh, 22. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. spirit. So what does that mean? If you're built together, that just simply means you are in... I'm just going to write Jesus. Right here. 
this time. You are in Christ. Why? Because you're being built together. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is in you, making you one with Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Because the truth is, the tomb is empty. Yeah. Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb. And because Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb, He has overcome death. He can overcome anything that goes on in your life. Because Jesus went from death to life, you now have the power through the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit that's living inside of you, because you are now uh, filled with hope and a citizen of, of heaven together with Jesus. You are alive. And Jesus, if He can overcome death, death is pretty permanent, right? If Jesus can overcome death, don't you think He can overcome the situation that you face right now? Amen. Don't you think He can overcome the little petty things that we concern ourselves about? Yes. Amen. And this is what I want our church. Grace makes us go from death to life. And we don't cross that line because we're good people. We cross that line because God is good and He has already done it and He's already paved the way for us. He's the one that bridges the gap between the two for us. And this is what I want for our church to be a people that is focusing on this board right here because this there's 20,000 people right now in the city of Lapine who are on this board right now. Amen. And we should be a church that focuses on this board. Because we're already over here. We've already got the benefits. We've already got the retirement package, right? That's awesome. But we need to focus on reaching these people. Right. Not reaching more and more of these people. They're, they're, they're already one, right? This, this, that's not the goal. The goal is to reach those and show them that Jesus has already bridged the gap. And they can go from death to life. And they can go from being separate to together. They can go from being foreigners to citizens. They can go to being without hope to be filled with hope. They can go to being without God to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? That's what we should be focusing on. That's what we should be doing as a church, as a body of believers. Yes. Not sitting around as a bunch of churches and, and complaining. There's just no that. Why don't we get up from the table and actually go reach those people? Mm -hmm. Why don't we go talk to our neighbors? Yes. Why don't we hand out the little, you know, we got these invite cards. Hand them out. That's what they're for. Give them to people. Why not invite people? Say, hey, we have a potluck coming. You don't have to bring nothing to show up. It's, we're going to feed you. It's going to be awesome, right? Our pastor's a little weird, but that's okay. You know, the food is free and it's good, right? Do those things. Invite people. Show them that Jesus Christ has made a way for them. Because here's, here's a scripture that we're going to, this is going to be the last scripture for today. 2 Corinthians 4.15. All of this, all of this is for your benefit. So that grace that is reaching what? More and more. More and more people. All of this is for your benefit. So the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Amen. Praise. All of this is for your benefit. So that more and more people can come to know Jesus Christ and that joy can overflow by the grace of God. Amen. For the glory of God. This is why, this is why we do what we do as a church. To reach these people. This, the, the vision statement of the church. Win one, teach one. You've already won. Win one and teach one. Amen. That's what Paul did. One at a time. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Win one. We're going to get into this stuff in January a lot more deeper. Right? Just, just so you know. And I know it's like we, we talk about the same things all the time. Yeah. Well, that's part of giving vision for the church, right? If The more we talk about it, the more it, becomes, it sinks in. And we, when we get to the point to where I'm sick of talking about it, we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Because then it's just starting to sink in everybody else, right? We are here to win one person and teach them all the benefits. Because right. all this is for you. Amen. Win one, teach one. Amen. It's almost like we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know some people, and I, I've, I've heard it at multiple churches that I've been a part of, and one of them was here. And uh, <laughs> this, is, this is so beyond me. 
but we're not going to use this church. We're going to use another church for an example uh, because those people ain't here no more. So, <laughs> but we had a guy uh, at our last church. Once we started reaching about 130 people or so on an average Sunday, he would he would say on a, he he would come up and he'd say, you know, I think the church is getting too big. <laughs> because I just don't know everybody. And, and it's just, there's just too many people. And I'm like, you know, I've only been saved for uh, 16, uh, no, 15, 14 years now. Uh, heaven is going to be filled with a lot of people. What are you going to do if you get to heaven and there's too many people? It's too late. You're already there, right? So... <laughs> this is, this is just, I think the church is just getting too big. Isn't it funny how nobody says that about hospitals? Yeah. I think this hospital is getting too big. I mean, there's just too many sick people showing up, and I don't know everybody, and we just need to be a hospital. We need to cut back on size and, and uh, just have you know healthy people here, and when those sick people get healthy, then maybe we'll let them in. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody says that about the Red Cross. Yeah. Right? Oh, I love what they're doing, but, you know, I think that organization is just getting a little too big. Right? But what people say about churches, well, you know, I, just, I, I don't know anybody, and, and uh, there's just too many people. When the, when the church stops caring about this board and is only focused on this, you better just close the doors. Because you've already violated God's law. Right? And you're not doing what God's called you to do. God says we're to focus on these people and bring those people into the church. And when we stop focusing on getting the sick people to the one who can save them and heal them and restore them, we've missed the mark altogether. And we just need to close doors and go somewhere else. Amen? Amen. So we're going to be a church that focuses on reaching the dead, separate, the foreigners without hope and do not know Christ Jesus. Because church size has nothing to do about how many seats you have in the building. That's right. It has to do with everything about the hearts and the minds of the people in the building. Mm -hmm. As soon as we start to think we're just too small to do anything, you've already lost. Church has nothing to do about numbers. Right. It has to do with the hearts and the minds of the people in the church. Mm -hmm. Because if we can come together as a body of believers and say, you know, it, it, this, is, this is honestly... This is the biggest prayer that I have for our church. That we have a true revival. We're reaching people off of this list. Now I just have an extra church services every week. But I pray this more above, far above anything else that I pray for this church. Is that we are a church that is reaching the lost of this city. Because there's 20,000 people right now who don't know who Jesus Christ is. And there's more than enough people in the city of Lapine for all the churches. Amen. And we need to be a people that reaches these people on this board right here. And, and, and I know because of church finances. Yeah, that's on my list, but that's honestly, I pray for the finances of the church. But it's, it's, it's nowhere near as much as I pray for this. Right. Because I focus on this, God will take care of everything else. Right. And we could say, well, we got, what's the thing on 4th of July? I should know about it now, it's been a year. Frontier days? Frontier days, right? Uh, after being able to go through it this year, what I want to do next year for Frontier Days is set up a little misting station because they, you just get the little hose and hook it up and people come because it's stinking hot out there, right? And give away bottles of water just for free. Just show up to our tent. We'll give you a bottle of water. We'll have a misting station so you can walk through and cool off and, and just if you have any questions, that's great. If you don't, you just want the free water, take the water and go. But praise God. But doing an outreach and it's like, well, that costs money. Yes, it does. We get more that's fine. But if we start to think, well, it just costs too much before we can't do it. We're just too small of a church. You've already lost. That's right. Because we can come together as a body and find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what's so awesome about leading a smaller church as opposed to a church that, that brings in millions of dollars uh, a week because they need millions of dollars a month to run their facilities. Mm -hmm. Is we get to be more creative with what God has given us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want all the stuff. You know, I want the lights. I want the, the, the buildings. I want all that stuff, right? Because it, it's, it's, it, it's nice to have all that stuff. But if we can learn to trust God yeah. and focus on God and be more creative with what he's given us, mm 
right? Because on our, well, our envelope's gone now, but in Deuteronomy 16, 17, what God has already given you, right? So what He's given you. If He's blessed you with this, bless other people with that. Yes. Let's take what God's given us to reach those people. Amen? Amen. Where are we? The church gets too big when we stop caring about the people on that board right there. And what is your reaction to seeing how Jesus is changing more and more people? If your reaction is there's too many people at church, you're at the wrong church. Because we're a church that celebrates people coming from death to life. We're a church that's going to celebrate people coming in. If you're coming in messed up, that's, that's fine. That's okay. God takes messed up people. And it's because there ain't a same person sitting here ain't messed up. Amen. God takes messed up people. And it's okay to come in messed up. It's okay to come in with problems and, and, and life just getting a hold of you. But it's not okay to stay that way. Right. And Jesus is the one that can fix those things. And you've got to focus on Christ Jesus. And what is your reaction when you start to see people changing and more and more people are coming to know Christ? Mm -hmm. Right? So there's five things you can do. And we'll close. It'll be quick, I promise. Five things you can do right now. So you better get a piece of paper. Write it down. Five things you can do. You're going to get home and be like, he said five things, but I don't remember what they were. Five things you can do. Number one, you can pray. Mm -hmm. You can pray. You can pray that our church becomes a church that, that is alive and active and doing outreach, a church that is, is actively seeking to impact the community around us, not just trying to survive and, and, and just go through church. Because aren't you sick of just doing church as usual? Until something changes, until we start to change how we feel about church, it's always going to be the same, right? And then, and you know what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results, right? So, pray that our church becomes alive. Because we are no longer dead. We are alive. And we should celebrate that. We are no longer dead. We are alive. We're no longer dead. We are alive. And we can be a church that is alive and speak God's word in our lives. Amen. So pray that our church does, and don't just pray for our church. I mean, we need the church needs prayer. But I want you to pray for yourself and how I can make a difference in the church that you place me, God. Simple prayers. Pray for yourself and how you can be the person that is reaching the dead people and showing them the way to life. Pray for yourself. Pray for the church. Number two. You can invite people, right? Again, we have little invite cards. It's easy. It's got the address on the back. It's got the service times. It's got a map. It's got the web page on the front, right? This is this about as much information as you can give out right there. Hand them out. We've got a whole box full of them. Give them to people. Take a, you know, 15, 20 of them with you. And as you go throughout the day, don't live like hermits stuck in your house all day long, but actually get out in the community and hand out cards and invite people to church and, and, and become part of the community God has placed you in. Yes. Amen? Amen? Number three, get involved in serving. Get involved in serving. Because I'm, me and Kizzy both are, we average about 50 hours a week at a full-time job mm -hmm. each. I cannot do it all. That's right. right? We need people. To get involved in serving the church. We need people to clean. We need people to, to set up. And, 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 to, and just there's so much stuff that the church needs to be done. Because 50 hours a week of a regular job. And then it takes uh, maybe 20 hours or so for me to come up with a Sunday morning service. On top of Wednesday night service, which is probably another 5 to 6 hours of research and study. This is, you know, this is one of the reasons we're not having service tonight. Because we're just going to get together as a family. And we're going to... Be with one another and just be a family, right? Get involved in serving. I know you're like, well, I tried to do children's church one time and it sucked, right? Yeah, I know, right? I don't like working with kids either, right? I don't mind teenagers and doing the youth, but with like, you know, little kids, it's just, you know, it's just boogers and, and all that stuff all the time, and I don't like that stuff, right? That's fine. You get involved, you didn't try it, I didn't like that. Great. 
We're gonna, we can make you a greeter at the door. You know, but you got to be happy. You can't be, welcome to church, right? You know, we'll find a place. There are so many places to serve in this church. Number four. This is, this is the hard one. This is the one where everyone's either like, oh yeah, or oh boy. <laughs> it is. Number four. Get involved through giving. Get involved through giving. Because this is, this is what it comes down to. The garbage disposal in the back there has not worked for a year and a half. There's a dishwasher. We could have people come here and say, we're, we're going to buy the church a dishwasher. We're going to buy the church a garbage disposal. That could happen today, right now, right? And this is where people are like, oh yeah, because those are the ones that are already giving. And our church is great at giving in the tithes. I mean, we have over 90, we have about 99% tithe rate in this church. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, right? I don't know any other church that has a 99% tithe rate in the church, right? I, as far as I know, we're the only ones. So we're doing awesome on that. But God has given you seeds to plant. And do it through prayer, right? Don't just foolishly give. God has given you stuff. Pray to God. Get it all through giving. And I know some people are like, well, you know, the church is all about money and, and, and this and that. If I give God this amount of money, then I'm not going to have any and God's going to forget about me. And all. Let me give you some facts that I looked up last night. The state of Oregon... Last year spent $28 million to promote tourism in the state. Mm -hmm. And nobody complains about it. The return on investment was $12 million. They spent $28 million to get a return of $12 million. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's okay. The state of Oregon spent $7 billion last year. B. Seven B. B. Billion. More than a million, but B million, said one of the highest uh, states in the country spends more money on schooling and has the worst school system in all 50 states. Because it's seven billion, and nobody, and we're like, we gotta get more to the schools. We gotta get more to schools. Nobody complains about that stuff, right? And, we, and we're like, we'll do that. Well, yeah, that's great. We'll continue. But when it comes to church and we say we need, we, we want to put a, a TV on the back so the singers don't have to have the stands up here and we can we can do the words uh, confidence monitor and, and actually engage in worship. Well, you know, that's, you know, that's $300, Pastor. What are we going to do? <laughs> this is the way that works in church. Pray about giving, uh, getting involved through giving. And lastly, Believe that the best is really yet to come. Amen. Believe that the best is really... Because I believe that the best is yet to come for this church. I believe it. I mean, I believe... Kizzy, she, she's had this... I've had a vision for what God has given me in my life. And Kizzy, like, a couple nights ago, was like, I had a dream. And I'm not good with interpreting dreams. So if you have dreams... You can come tell me, I'm going to smile and shake my head, and, but I don't really, I, I'm not Daniel, right? <laughs> I can't interpret your dreams, right? This is not my gifting. And sometimes I don't only really care about your dreams, but people come, I pass around this, because he's like, I had a dream. It's going to be some funny thing with like colors, and, and there's a spotted elephant, and he's swimming across the ocean, and what does that mean, right? You know, I, you know, I had bad pizza. I don't know. Right? So, but Kizzy's like, I had this dream, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna share her dream. She's like, I had this dream that we that I came into the sanctuary, and it was it was just packed full of people, and I couldn't find a place to sit, and I had to stand in the back and just watch you on the screen because there was nowhere to go. And I'm like, that's awesome. The best is yet to come. Right? That's, that's a vision I have for this city, for, the, for this community, that the best is yet to come. People are like, what's your favorite sermon series? I, I don't know. Right, right now it's this one. Next month it's going to be that one, right? Because the best, what's your favorite sermon you've ever preached, right? Like, like last week was pretty good, right? I'm enjoying this week, whether you're enjoying it or not. Next week I know it's going to be awesome because we've got to wait for it. And it's going to be, you know, we're going to start working out and it's going to be cool. And, and you know, and the best is yet to come. That's a nice bunch of hype. It's only hype if you don't believe it. Sorry. I believe our children's church curriculum, the best is yet to come for that.
Mm -hmm. I believe this church, the best is yet to come. I believe this sermon series is the best is yet to come. Amen. You have to believe. You have to pray, get involved in serving and giving, and, and invite people and believe that the best is yet to come. Father God, Lord, I thank you.